a talk by Dr. Maria Chan. The title of the talk is Defect and Dynamic Properties of Perovskite Halides from First Principles. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Maria Chan and then she will get started. Uh, before then also, um, she already told me that she can take questions during the talk. So anytime you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask her. If you put the questions in the chat also, I'll read them to her at the end. Um, but during the talk, you can unmute yourself and ask her the questions. So Dr. Maria Chan obtained her BS in Physics and Applied Mathematics from the University of California, Los Angeles, and her PhD in Physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And then since 2012, Dr. Chan has been a staff scientist at the Center for Nanoscale Materials, which is part of the Agua National Lab um, in, in Illinois, near Chicago. Her research focuses on material properties using first principles, atomistic and machine learning methods, particularly in applications towards materials relevant to energy technologies, such as energy storage, photovoltaics, catalysis, and thermal management. She also works on the integration of experimental characterization and computational modeling using artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches. So we welcome um, Dr. Maria to give us the seminar. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you so much, Omo, and thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, to everyone. I am really excited um, to be here um, virtually and connect with you across you know, the, the other side of the world. Um, so uh, my main talk today will be about defects and dynamics, uh, perovskite halides, as, as mentioned. Um, I want to mention that a lot of this work is done by my postdoc, Arun Manodi Kanekitodi. Um, and um, um, I have uh, other collaborators, uh, Peijun Guo, Ben Duro, uh, Richard Schaller, and Angela Chen do the, the, the experimental uh, measurements, ultrafast spectroscopy primarily. And Alpa Kinati was uh, my uh, former postdoc who um, also did some ab ab initial molecular dynamic simulations. Um, but before I get into perovskites, I want to talk about um, nanoscience, re nanoscale science research centers uh, in the US. Um, which are available as resources for you. Um, so <clears throat> the Nanoscale Science Research Centers, um, there are five of them. I can show you a map here. Um, they were at um, Argo National Lab where I work. Um, it, we have the Center for Nanoscale Materials. Um, at Berkeley Lab on the west coast of the US, um, there's a molecular foundry. Um, in the south side, um, there's uh, Southwest, um, there's the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies that are in two different labs. Um, in the southeast side, there's the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, which has the Center for Nanophase Material Science. Um, and um, then on the east coast, there's the Center for Fun Functional Nanomaterials. Um, so there are these five nano centers that are funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, uh, they were 10, 15 years ago, there was um, this National Nanotechnology Initiative in the U.S. and they started these nano centers. Um, they're often connected to X-ray sources or neutron sources, and they have a lot of um, uh, experimental capabilities. And um, this is an example for um, the Center for Nanoscale Materials where I work. They have synthesis capabilities, nanofabrication, advanced microscopy, and nanophotonics. And um, given the current situation with uh, coronavirus, there actually have been a lot of push towards doing a lot of things virtually. Um, so we have a capabilities for people um, to control the experiments uh, from uh, uh, remotely. Um, so there is now um, x-ray experiments uh, being done um, where the user sent a sample um, to us and then we have a staff member loaded and the user actually are thousands of miles away controlling the, the, the experiment, um, the data acquisition and getting the data. So even if you do um, experiments, um, it's, it's starting to be possible uh, to use these facilities uh, remotely. But of course, um, I do theory and modeling and we've always been able to do this. Um, we've had users from uh, many different countries um, who, who have used, I have had someone from, from Colombia, from, from South America. Um, we've had Turkish uh, users um, and um, we have users in Asia. We've had users in Europe um, connect to our computing cluster and um, are able to carry out computation. 
So this is a summary of um, a few of our statistics. We have 600 users each year. Um, there are hundreds of tools and equipment. Um, and then we have um, users from 31 different countries. Um, so, so this is a, a global facility um, that is available for anyone doing open science research. Um, so in particular, the computational cap capability I'm talking about, um, it's called the Carbon Computing Cluster. Um, currently, we have 2,800 cores, and then, but we're getting a new upgrade of 22 nodes uh, with 24 cores each, uh, and then the two GPUs. So if anyone is uh, interested in using GPUs for their simulations um, or some machine learning work, uh, then, um, you know, this is a, a good opportunity because, you know, 44 parallel GPUs is, is uh, quite a good collection. Um, we have also, as part of our support team, a dedicated high-performance computing specialist, Michael Sternberg, his picture, he's great. Um, one of the things that he's able to do is he gets a lot of the, uh, you know, most of the major Thomistic and first principle simulation codes. Um, he has made them available on the carbon cluster and he's available to help um, with a, um, any kind of questions with regard to um, compiling codes, running them, optimizing the performance and so on. Um, one of the advantages um, of our cluster, even though it's modest in size, is that uh, it has reasonable queue times. Um, some of the larger, uh, I don't know what the situation with your respective places, but um, some of the um, computing clusters can have a lot of uh, com computer cores, but then the wait times are much longer. Um, we have reasonable wait times. Um, and then one of the good things is that it allows um, long runtime, up to 10 days. So some of the publicly shared computing clusters have a time limit of one or two days. I don't know what the situation with your your uh, individual um, places are, but in 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 uh, many of the shared facility in the U.S., the limit is uh, one or two days. So having a long uh, runtime is especially useful for something like ab initio molecular dynamics. Um, those of you who have done uh, AIMD will know that um, a lot of times it, it takes a long time for it to run and you can't speed it up with using more cores. Um, so this is um, what um, our, our resources are and uh, OMO has a, a sent a, um, a flyer. Um, we are calling for a proposals. Anyone who's interested, I'm happy to work with them. Um, I'm talking about our f capabilities at Argon, but there are other uh, similar capabilities in other labs, and they are all on board. And we we're happy to um, you know work with anyone who's interested in using these computing clusters. So either someone can primarily use the computer facilities, or they can uh, work with a staff scientist and um, you know work on some collaborative research or some you know combination. So the degree of collaboration is completely open. Um, I've had users who, who, you know, primarily send me an email a year saying I'm using your cluster, you know, there are no questions. Um, I have users who I work with, you know, on a biweekly basis, we have meetings every other week. Um, so, you know, the, that's, that's um, an open arrangement. Okay, so with that said, I like to uh, dive into research. Um, so in my research group, I have uh, three main research thrusts. Um, the first one is what I'm going to talk to you today about. Um, it's uh, understanding and designing renewable energy materials. Um, so I started my uh, scientific career working on solar cells, uh, but I've also branched into uh, batteries, thermoelectrics, and catalysis. So uh, we have uh, first principles and um, a little bit of molecular dynamics work on all of those areas. Um, the second thrust has to do with uh, improving the method of calculations. Um, so trying to have faster calculations or more accurate calculations. Um, these are um, our, our goals. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, faster calculations today through the use of machine learning. Um, and then finally, one of my main thrusts um, um, that is increasingly in importance is how do we combine uh, computational modeling with experiments um, using machine learning in particular, um, being able to um, 
um, do some kind of information extraction from the experimental data with the help of computational modeling and vice versa. Because uh, for many of you who worked, uh, you know, either you're an experimentalist or a computational uh, researcher, you've worked with the other uh, types and you realize that sometimes you need both sides to bring in the information to actually get a good picture of what's happening. Um, so machine learning is increasingly important uh, in, in, you know, the second and third thrust, uh, and then by extension impacts the first thrust as, as well. So um, what I'm going to talk about today has to do with perovskites, uh, halides, uh, and, and these are, of course, very important um, for solar cell materials, um, optoelectronics, and um, um, even in some cases, uh, photocatalysis or other um, application infrared detection and, and so on. Um, so the I'm going to talk about two separate area. One of them is uh, point defect engineering. Um, so looking at how uh, substituting different elements into the perovskite changes its properties and how we can use machine learning to extract these properties. Um, the second aspect has to do with dynamics of uh, electron and phonon uh, interaction inside the materials. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first one. So um, as, as many of you know, in a semiconductor, a defect in impurity levels uh, are cr uh, crucial to electronic applications. Um, shallow donor and acceptor levels allow um, doping and um, therefore the tuning of um, uh, the type of conductivity as well as carrier concentration. Um, deep defect levels, um, the levels that are um, deeper in the middle, um, actually have, you know, two uh, opposing characteristics. Um, they can be electron hole recombination centers, which are bad for performance. Um, they, they lose uh, carriers. Or they can be intermediate band for subgap absorption, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more, more about. And it, it is good. So um, those are like opposing characters. Um, so in particular, a lot of our work uh, will, will have to do with uh, methyl ammonium lead uh, halides. Um, methyl ammonium is this molecule here, uh, CH3, NH3. Um, and um, the, the, the Borovskite uh, A cycad ion is the methyl ammonium. Uh, B cycad ion is lead. And then the anion is either iodide, bromide, or chloride. Um, so these are, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, increasingly important for solar cells, LEDs, and so on. Um, and um, one of the things that make it so interesting is that you can vary a lot. Um, the A site, the B site, the, the X, you know, essentially all of the sites can be varied by compositional engineering. Um, and then here, um, we are focusing on the impurities and in the lead site, so the B site cation. Um, and then we were looking at how that changes its properties. Um, so one can look at first the defect property of um, uh, methamyl lead, lead uh, bromide uh, in this example. I'll show a lot of plots that look like this. Um, these are obtained from density functional theory calculations. Um, and what they show is the formation energy of different defects as a function of the Fermi level. So in a, in a, a semiconductor, although, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to dope these uh, halide materials, um, in a semiconductor in general, um, you can tune the Fermi level from the conduction, uh, from the valence band maximum to the conduction band minimum. As you tune that uh, Fermi level, the energy of different defect changes because uh, of the fact that they are charged. Um, so for example, here VBR means a bromine vacancy um, and the, the slope of the um, uh, plot uh, indicate the, the charge state. So a bromine vacancy here is positively charged, uh, plus one charged. And um, as you tune from um, P-type to N-type, the bromine vacancy energy goes up. Um, and then at some point, if you're sufficiently N-type, the preferred charge state for bromine vacancy is actually neutral, so it's flat. And similarly, uh, methyl ammonium vacancy is negatively charged. Um, that's why it goes down. Um, and then at some point here, you see a dashed line. Um, that is the point where, uh, in the absence of any other dopants, uh, the, the um, uh, positively charged and the negatively charged uh, defects actually um, are at, at the same energy. Um, so they are at the same number. So the energy controls the number of the defects. Um, and therefore, this will be the Fermi level um, of the intrinsic material. 
Um, so we use a lot of these pots to find out how um, um, a material, what, what type of defects are dominant, so lower energy is dominant, um, and uh, what controls uh, how um, the charge carriers are, what type the charge carriers are in this material. Um, so um, in the equilibrium, yeah, I've said all of this. Um, and the compensation of impurities um, means impurities that uh, dominate. So one of the uh, thing you might note here is all of these defects shown here are intrinsic. Um, so methamonium vacancy, lead vacancy, methamonium um, anti-site, so a lead uh, cation on a methamonium site, so B on A, um, it's higher in energy because the sizes don't fit. Uh, but then I can start putting in um, the formation energy of extrinsic defects, things that are not in methamonium lead uh, bromide, and then find out what um, the, the energies are. If some of those energies are actually below uh, bromide vacancy, for example, they may then be able to shift um, the Fermi level. And I, I'll show some examples later. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there's this concept of intermediate band solar cell uh, in which you have a band in the middle of the band gap. Um, what that allows us to do, and, and this here shown is a solar, solar spectrum uh, as a function of wavelengths, so redder uh, and um, shorter wavelengths, uh, bluer and then ultraviolet here and so on. Um, so instead of one uh, band gap blue here that can only accept the higher energy photons, uh, in the solar spectrum. If you have an intermediate band, one can imagine having um, the ability to absorb the, um, some uh, longer wavelength photons, so use more of the solar spectrum. Um, and then if you excite an electron hole here, an electron hole here, um, you can essentially um, sort of promote uh, you know, one electron hole pair in the um, size of the band gap. Um, that allows you to, to capture more of the energy of the solar cell. And that's why it was uh, worth considering. Um, so uh, we started this work in uh, 2017 or so uh, by looking at um, partial lead substitution by covalt in, um, in the methamonium lead uh, bromide and, and bromide chloride mixtures. Um, bromide has a bigger band gap than iodide. That's why we looked at it. Um, for It turns out that for intermediate band solar cells, having a larger band gap is advantageous. Um, so cobalt substituting on that site, we predicted with the density functional theory um, that would have an intermediate band. Um, and and uh, indeed, an experimental colleagues uh, sub, uh, uh, fabricated these materials, uh, synthesized these materials, and found subband gap absorption. Um, so this is the, the gap here at about 2.2 uh, and, and higher. Um, and um, you, they see that at a lower energy, there is some kind of um, subgap absorption, and this work was published. Um, and then we started saying, you know, what other impurities can do this? We would like to have a general model uh, using computation um, to see, you know, what, what are the, um, the possibilities with uh, substitution. So I mentioned earlier um, these uh, uh, defect energies, formation energies that I showed earlier. <clears throat> Um, they came from DFT total uh, uh, energy calculations. So we start with a pure, pure uh, material, so methamonium lead out, uh, bromide here, um, and then we put a defect. So here, for example, um, instead of the gray lead, um, we put in a, a blue cobalt, um, and you can see the distortion of the um, octahedron um, once that's put in, we do that calculation. We subtract out um, the um, number and chemical potential of the atoms being removed. We have to account for the um, lead and cobalt being um, added and removed. Um, and then we account for the uh, Fermi energy, as I shown earlier. Um, and there's a correction energy and that is due to the periodic interaction between charged um, cells. Um, so with all of that, we get a, a, a figure like this, um, like I explained earlier. And I mentioned um, that, you know, if you substitute something and it has a lower formation energy than the intrinsic um, um, defects, then you are able to move the Fermi level. So for example, zirconium sitting on lead side moves the Fermi level towards more N-type. Um, and um, that introduces a um, uh, intermediate band um, that is a, the charge state change from plus two to plus one charge state in the zirconium. Um, so these we call dominant. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. What, what code do you use? What code? Oh, we use FASP. Um, okay. Vienna Ab initial simulation package. Yeah. Should and I program in the E, the E, the correction then I go into periodic interaction between charges is programmed in VASP, right? Um, yeah, the, we use uh, Fiso's uh, correction scheme. Um, he has a, a script um, that, that allows us to calculate the results um, okay. From, okay. from the fast output. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Um, so, yeah, the impurities that can create a lower energy than the intrinsic, we call them um, dominant in, 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 uh, impurities. Um, and so um, this, this example is shown here, uh, like I mentioned, zirconium does this. Um, the question is what else, what, are, what other impurities are dominant or uh, close, you know, uh, because there is a, a range of um, chemical potentials available for every element. Um, so what we did is we took all of these, everything shaded um, in, in, in light purple here, um, and substitute it on the lead side um, in methyl ammonium lead bromide and then see what happens. Um, <clears throat> so those are uh, many calculations. We have a high throughput uh, workflow that uh, allows to control the, the calculations as, as many people have done. Um, and um, what we found are the results here. Um, so I, I will show a few slides for different periods. Um, so these are the, the lighter elements um, that generally don't have a lot of uh, uh, mid-gap states, except uh, maybe phosphorus. Um, and um, then the 3D transition metals, you see that um, you know, there's cobalt that we, we saw earlier, um, but there's also nickel and other um, defect, um, sorry, um, clicked backwards, um, other introducing uh, defects. So the way I plotted this here is, is a little different. Uh, what you see are just um, the transition levels. This is where the um, charges um, change charge state. So the zirconium transition level would be right here at about say 1.4 EV. Um, so only those are, are plotted here. Um, and um, we can continue to see that um, transition metals tend to give a lot of uh, mid-gap states um, and then continue so on. Um, so <clears throat> these are all the substituents that are uh, studied and mid-gap energy levels are found in almost, you know, in, in a lot of them, um, not all, but all of them, uh, except, you know, the um, alkali metal um, and uh, alkali earth metals, they don't tend to give uh, mid-gap states. Um, so the other thing we want to um, take a look at is um, the um, dependence on uh, chemical potentials. Um, so you see here, um, you have uh, bromine rich, rich conditions. So these, these um, chemical potentials uh, affect the defects um, by way of the correction term, because once um, you in, uh, include a substituent atom, you have to account for the chemical potential um, and changing uh, the conditions. So bromine rich condition will have um, um, bromine uh, 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 element uh, energy and also um, the, it will it will tend to decrease the metal energy and and vice versa um, so in lead rich condition um, the the metal energy the lead energy is higher and the bromine energy is lower and that affects the um, defect formation energies in some cases you see that um, the material becomes unstable um, because the formation energy of um, um, a lot of intrinsic defects are actually negative so bromine rich condition it's unstable and um, you know you will talk to uh, synthesis people and you'll find that um, you know they consider the synthesis condition more lead rich um, and then in the intermediate um, condition you can see that um, the uh, uh, equilibrium fermi level it's a little more towards the the p type side whereas um, the lead rich condition is more in the middle um, so was there a question Oh, okay. Um, so, and then we looked at impurity compensating intrinsic defects. Um, so I showed the zirconium earlier, but then we can also look at molybdenum. I should point to the middle and the right side because um, we're more moderate or leverage. Um, so um, hafnium, zirconium, um, scandium, those are sort of low energy uh, substituents. 
um, and um, they can potentially be used um, for um, uh, intermediate band solar cell materials in addition to cobalt we found earlier. Um, so these tend to be early transition metals. Um, we also look at variation in um, anion um, um, concentrations. So primarily we started with bromide, but then we also look at uh, bromide chloride and chloride. Uh, if you look at the intrinsic um, um, defects, you see that uh, initially the halide vacancy um, is um, in equilibrium with um, the methylmonium vacancy. But um, for, for chloride, um, actually lead on a methylmonium site becomes uh, important as well. Um, yeah, so um, we look at several um, intrinsic uh, 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 look at intrinsic defects for the uh, uh, mix uh, bromide chloride as a function again of chemical potentials. Bromide rich is still unstable, uh, whereas lead rich is uh, more stable. Um, and in in that case, we have um, yttrium on lead side being a dominant uh, impurity. Um, so we have. Um, a lot of these uh, calculated. Um, and then again, we, we can see that for chloride, um, zirconium, uh, again, it's, it's and yttrium, again, low energy defects. Um, so just to put them all together, we look at a, a few um, substitutions, uh, scandium, yttrium, zirconium, niobium, molybdenum, and hafnium um, that tend to be uh, important, um, and then compare them uh, on um, the same scale with uh, bromide chloride and, and um, mixed bromide chloride. And yeah. Yeah, as I see, all your energy is only about the family level. I don't know why I choose to work only on family level. Sorry, there was a little bit of cut out. Why did we choose to do only on what? On family level. As I say on all your graph, your energy is at family level. Why have you worked only at family level? Can you go under or, or above? Thank you for this. Thank you. Yeah, so the Fermi level um, varies uh, from, from the valence by maximum to the conduction by minimum. Um, so we, we, we use it as a variable, basically, um, because we don't know what the Fermi level is in the material um, until we do these calculations and we determine um, that theoretically the equilibrium Fermi level is it's here um, that is controlled um, by the two. It, it, intrinsic uh, positive defect and negative defect. Um, and, and same here, so th this here says energy level, but it's the Fermi level of you. Uh, well, this, these are the transition levels um, and they can be above or below the equilibrium Fermi level. Um, so a charge transition, and this, these are what you will measure using cathode luminescence um, or uh, DLTS. Um, both, both types of measurements will give you an energy level of a, a defect state uh, somewhere in, inside the band gap. Um, so what we can see is that, um, for example, niobium changes um, from more mid gap to uh, more, more, uh, more shallow um, in, from bromide to chloride. So that's, that's you know, um, a good or a bad thing. If you want an intermediate band solar cell um, material for uh, bromide, niobium could be a good choice, but um, you know, if it's mixed halide or chloride, then it's not a good choice. Um, so did that answer your question? Sorry. No, the answer was, the, the question was answered, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so the other thing that we want to do after doing all these calculations is to use machine learning um, to help do this prediction. There was a lot of calculations um, we have um, uh, done and they are on a, a big supercell and, and that costs a lot of computational time. We also, you know, just have a list of numbers, we want to try to find patterns in those list of numbers. Um, and so we use this um, um, uh, machine learning framework in which we have materials we generate using DFT, a lot of um, properties, in this case, defect properties, impurity properties. Um, but then we also try to use descriptors, um, just trying to um, use some, something about the elements um, and then fit a model to these um, properties. 
Um, the descriptors we use are elemental properties, so um, something like ionic radius, electronegativity, you know, is there something about cobalt, um, electronegativity, ionic radius, or other, you know, um, you know binding energy, other um, properties that can predict um, the Im Im impurity level um, um, that we calculate. So we also use a unit cell calculation that's much smaller. So um, just just uh, methamonium, uh, one one lead and um, one iodide uh, or, or bromide uh, in in these calculations. So these are uh, again uses descriptors um, to try to predict the properties. Um, so there is um, uh, we we first do a correlation map. What's shown here is the um, correlation uh, in the calculated property with respect to each descriptor. So as I mentioned here, um, electron affinity or electronegativity of the substituent um, element, it's plotted uh, against the calculated property. So plus one, uh, plus two, plus one charge state transition levels, the formation energy of the neutral defects and, and all the other transition levels. And you can see that um, some of them are um, very strongly correlated. So the darker it is, the more strong the correlation is. Um, the very strong correlated uh, properties include, for example, the unit cell calculation, um, or um, actually, um, it, you know, the melting point of the metal. Um, so that has to do with binding energy uh, uh, um, of, of the defect or ionization energy of, of the, um, the substituent actually affects um, the charge transition level. But the strongest uh, correlations we see, the darkest colors here are actually the unit cell defect calculations. Um, so we can use these correlations then to find a combination of um, um, property, the descriptor that predicts the formation energy. And we show one of example here, um, is a very good correlation. The mean absolute error is about 0.3 EV, um, which is uh, pretty good. Um, and um, what that is is uh, what 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 that means is that we can now predict um, the formation energy of uh, defects without doing DFT calculations, or we can find the trend um, between the calculated um, um, formation energy and um, some properties of of the uh, substituents. Um, another example here is the plus one to zero transition level, um, and that's uh, um, predicted uh, by the uh, methamonium metal bromide. So, so instead of um, having a methamonium lead bromide and putting um, some portion of it uh, as cobalt, for example, we calculate methamonium cobalt bromide, and that lead as constant actually predicts the plus one zero transition level quite well. Um, another example here, um, zero minus one transition level. Um, and the prediction, again, it, it's pretty reasonable, uh, very small errors. Um, so the ongoing work with generalized this, this was on uh, methamonium lead uh, bromide before, um, just MAPBBR3, a pure bromide. Um, but we generalized this work uh, into uh, iodide, chloride, bromide, and, and mix, and then, um, trained machine learning uh, um, um, machine learning models, random forest models or neural network models, um, and then find that the the prediction and the calculations are generally you know pretty well matched to each other. Um, and there's more. Um, we've also looked at um, just changing. So previously we have methamonium lead um, halide, and then we put something on the lead side. But now we've actually say, you know, what if we have other, um, you know, A side cation, B side cation, uh, formidinium, um, cesium, other A side cations, um, as well as other B side, um, you know, tin and, and other uh, um, um, group four metals or, or even other metals altogether, um, and then calculate the properties. So um, we have. We essentially made a, a lot of different perovskites and predicted the property. Um, some properties are pretty well predicted, um, such as lattice constant, um, the PB band gap information energy. Um, some still have a little bit more scatter, such as the, the defect formation energy, um, but we're working on these um, 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 machine learning models. 
So in conclusion, um, the defect part of my talk, um, uh, we, we look at um, vacancy defects um, that pin the Fermi level in uh, methamonium lead halide perovskites. Um, we looked at substitution of different uh, metals and other elements onto the B site cation, the lead site, um, and find that several can dominate um, over the intrinsic uh, defects. Um, you know, they're mostly early transition metals. Um, and um, machine learning models have been used uh, on um, these calculations to try to train uh, prediction for the defect properties um, based on very simple uh, descriptors, either the element or uh, small calculations. Um, so that is all for the um, um, defect and impurity part of the perovskite talk. Do you want to ask any questions about this part before I move on to the next part? Yeah, any questions? Um, I have a question. Um, um, so to, to determine, my, my understanding of intermediate band is that for it to work as an intermediate band, it must have a, a, some sort of dispersion, right? So it must have a finite uh, um, bandwidth. Yeah, so, so what we actually want is a small bandwidth. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you, yeah. You check that in the band structure, or you relied on the on the results of the of the DOS calculation. Or... Yeah. So we did. That was the first thing. That was a good, great, great question. The first thing we checked. You know, it turns out that the DOS calculation has uh, very nearly the same um, information in terms of uh, if you look at the DOS and um, where the states are. Um, it, it has very similar. Um, uh, position as the transition level as as one should expect um, and um, you know most of the time they're fairly narrow uh, whenever there's an intermediate band um, so we, we haven't find and, and that's partly because there isn't a huge amount of hybridization uh, you know between the the um, impurity atoms, right? They're isolated from each other so you don't have, get a lot of hybridization and therefore you don't get a lot of dispersion. So, so ideally, how, how large would you like them to be for an intermediate band to work? And how large was it in your case? Uh, we have not done the statistics uh, on how wide the um, states are uh, in, the, in the DOS. Um, but I think if I recall correctly, we looked into the requirements and you know, they want something like a 0.2 EV um, or, or so um, with but I mean, just by examining, you know, most of the dots are, are uh, pretty sharp, like uh, for anything in the mid gap. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Sorry, Maria. There's a question. In the ask question. Uh, sorry, hold on. There's a question in the chat, Maria. All right. Okay. I yeah. I I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, well, there's a question in the chat about the structure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the um, so the question about uh, the methamonium precision that the great uh, so we actually um, did a pseudo cubic calculations um, and um, the um, the uh, methamonium atoms are aligned. So there certainly will be variations uh, if one um, choose a larger sampling, like so have a larger uh, cell with the methamonium being uh, arbitrarily rotated. Um, and um, if we look account for octahedral rotation, um, that certainly have a lot, there will be more uh, variations in the results. What we wanted to do was to, uh, because we're looking at both uh, iodide, bromide, chloride, and combination of them, and we're looking at all these elements in the periodic table, we want to just make them all standard um, and then look at a general trend. Um, but for anything interesting, certainly one can go into a lot more details um, and look at um, the different phases and uh, MA rotation. Um, yeah, so that, that's a great point. But uh, thank you for, for, for the answer. Um, yeah. Can you hear me or? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so it, it's just because if you made that choice, so your, your unit cell is polar. Um, 
Uh, so because you align all the molecules, so your, your structure is polar, so it doesn't make any effect if you look at uh, charge defects or you don't believe it, it will make a, a difference compared to a non-polar structure? So, um, yeah, so, so that's a good point. Um, the, dom the main effects of um, the charge structure will still be charge-charge interaction because that's a higher order. Uh, or sorry, lower order, like, so, um, you know, a charge dipole interaction will be one over R squared smaller already than a charge charge interaction, which is one over R, right? Um, so, so um, you know, there will be some effect of the polar interaction, but it will not be huge. Um, and certainly one can try to correct for the, the next term uh, in, the, in the charge um, dipole interaction as well. Um, yeah, so like I said, there's a lot of, um, um, corrections and variations one can do for individual material um, and um, that can be done. Um, you know, what one has to make, this is the thing about doing high throughput calculations and machine learning, one has to make certain choices, uh, unfortunately, um, of, you know, to, to allow us to do these hundreds of calculations. Um, so if you, you can do a bigger uh, supercell and then randomize the rotation of the MA molecule and actually do many of those calculations with different MA orientation and average the results. And that would be a much more proper um, study, um, but it would be much harder to do um, for, for all the elements in the product table and all the concentrations of the uh, um, halides that, that we looked at. So yeah, it's, it's a choice between doing you know, one carefully, or a small number carefully, or doing a large number on an approximate way. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So, I, I have a question. Uh, we'll come back to the questions. So let okay. her, let her go on to talk about the dynamics and then she'll come back to the questions. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm running a little low on time, but this part is a little shorter. Um, so the other part we talked about, we, we worked on is our equilibrium phonon dynamics, and this mostly concerned methamonium lead iodide. Um, so there's a very interesting photophysics that was observed by our experimental colleagues, Richard Schaller and his students, um, at short time, so 10 to 100 picosecond time scale. Um, so what first what they found was that they when they excite uh, the material at different wavelengths, um, they observe a significant difference in the ultrafast response um, in the hundreds of picosecond time scale. Um, so you know they shine a laser through it and then they they stop and then they observe um, the uh, photoluminescence uh, as a function of time. Um, the band gap of this material is about 1.5, 1.6. Um, if they look at different wavelengths above the band gap, um, they actually find that um, for a higher wavelength, um, there's a shorter uh, time. So the higher the photon energy, so for a small fo smaller photon energy, there's a very flat, so there's a very long decay time. Um, but for higher photon energy, there's actually a quite short decay time. Um, and that decay time is of order 50 to 80 picoseconds. Um, and it's sort of an unusual time scale for things to happen uh, in this material because usually electron electron thermalization is very fast. Um, the, any um, above gap electron will, will um, thermal, thermalize to the band edge um, you know, within one or 10 at most uh, picoseconds, uh, usually you know, closer to one picosecond. Um, and then phonon uh, timescales should be much larger than that. So, so they were trying to figure out um, what is happening in this uh, 50 to 80 picosecond timescale. And so they involved us in doing some simulations. So one of the things that one needs to notice is that there are two um, sublattices in the, in the material, the methamonium um, sublattice, which is very high phonon frequencies and the uh, lead aldehyde sublattice, which is very low phonon frequencies. Um, the other thing to notice is the electrons, the Bennett states on the conduction band minimum um, and uh, valence band maximum on the material. Sorry, this is moving by itself. Um, uh, it is shown in, in Sorry, I was muted. Um, 
yeah so uh shown in blue here uh, the let iodide forms the gap um and then the uh, methamonium states are much further away from the band gap um, if you look at the phonons um the inorganic the organics are separated in frequency um, so the very high frequency has to do with the uh, uh, CH bond and NH bond stretches. Um, the intermediate frequency has to do with CH and NH bond twists. Um, you have a little bit of um, lower energy, but still much higher than the inorganic uh, for, for twist modes. And then finally, um, the uh, lead distortion modes are very low. So lead iodide uh, distortion are at like 10 MeV. Um, so, um, one very small range of frequency shows the coupling between these two. Um, the, there is um, a, at about 50 uh, or 40 or so uh, MeV, you have some coupling between the two, two, two um, sublattice. Um, so, the question we asked was how do photo excitations actually affect radiative recombination? Because photoluminescence uh, probes radiative recombination. Um, and, um, you know, we want to know if phonons actually are playing a role in affecting that. Um, so, what we did in the calculations was uh, we displaced the atoms along the individual modes. So, we calculate the phonon modes, move the atoms along those modes, and then calculate the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum overlap. Um, the overlap actually uh, change um, in, in, in some cases, um, it doesn't affect uh, the overlap very much. So, you know, as you would expect, if you just stretch the CH and NH bonds, it doesn't affect the lead iodide, uh, CBM and, and VBM very much. But um, in those um, modes that actually couple um, the um, inorganic and organic subletters, we actually see a strong influence in the overlap. Um, so the mechanism that we think uh, may explain the 150, 80 picosecond process is that um, the photon come in, um, the higher energy photons actually excite the methylmonium electrons. Um, and those electrons affect uh, then, then um, sorry, it's here. Um, it affects the um, uh, methylmonium uh, electrons and, and then methylmonium phonons. And so you have this vibrating molecule basically at high energy uh, photon and that vibration um, slowly funnels this energy through uh, phonon phonon coupling into the inorganic sublattice. Um, and then whenever the uh, phonon modes that couple the two sublattices actually are excited, it affects the photoluminescence um, or radiative recombination. So that's the, the process. Um, and um, the, the test of that, um, well, the, so the energy transfer will be quite slow um, because there's only a few modes that couple the two um, sublattices uh, in terms of phonons. So a lot of energies will be stored in the organic molecules until that energy can be funneled into um, um, the rest of, of the lattice. Um, so what we did here to test is to use ab initial molecular dynamics um, and um, we excite these high energy uh, um, phonon modes. So we just physically stretch a, a, the NH bonds or the CH bonds, actually both of them, um, and then um, calculate a, a NVE, um, uh, ab initial molecular dynamics. Um, and then watch the temperature change. So the, the, it's uh, adiabatic, so there's no thermal set. Um, and then we watch the decay of the temperature as a function of time. And then we find a, a, a time constant for that decay. Um, it's somewhere in the range you know, of 50 to 80 picoseconds. So we think that that's a reasonable explanation um, for what is happening uh, when you have these excitations. Um, so to test that, uh, our colleague also do a probe. So we, uh, instead of um, shining in high energy photons, they explicitly shine in um, 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 photons that are corresponding to the organic phonon modes. Um, so they excite the stretch of the CH and NH directly, and then um, they they they. Um, um, sort of observe what, what happens, oh, sorry, they probe directly the organic phonon modes um, and then they find that um, when they excite the high energy, uh, sorry, I'm mixing up two work, work this is the earlier work, um, they pump the high energy photons um, and then observe the organic, uh, organic uh, mode 
and then find that uh, only when they pump with high energy photons, um, they see the organic vibrational modes happen. Um, so this was published a few years ago, but then it, eventually um, they started um, also uh, because of the, the conclusion of that work, they also started exciting directly the vibrational modes um, in the uh, methamonium molecules. Um, this was um, done uh, in a subsequent work and they calculate more, uh, I mean, they, they did more measurements. Um, so this is uh, infrared pump electron probe. Um, so they pump in the infrared, which is the vibrational modes of the methamonium, and then they um, probe um, in optical um, what the response is. And you can see some of the uh, um, AIMD results that correspond to this. So again, we, we did the same thing, selectively excite the NH modes, and then um, look at the stretch and, and rotation of different modes. Um, and then also find a, a um, good correspondence in terms of the time scale, as well as the fluence dependence. Um, so if, if there are more photons, you expect um, um, the vibrational mode to be excited more, and then you expect the um, uh, behavior of the different bond changes to, to also correspond. Um, so I can skip this over. Um, so primarily um, this follow on work pumps the vibrational modes of the methamonium. Um, it caused lattice heating, um, but it's not changed the, the near bank gap absorption. Um, so AMD essentially sort of paints a consistent picture um, if we excite these NH modes. And then finally, um, we also look at um, heat transfer from ligand coating to perovskite. So now in, instead of looking at what happens within the perovskite, we look at perovskite um, nanoparticles and what happens if you stick different ligands on the surface, how does the heat transport um, actually was affect, how, how was it affected? And this work was published um, last, in the last year. Um, so again, we did, um, uh, again, they did experiments um, looking at a pump probe, um, infrared pump electron probe again, looking at these results um, and um, look at how it decays with time. Um, we look at the trans, they, they looked at the transient kinetics at different wavelengths. Um, and then um, they saw that there's time um, to transfer the heat to the perovskites occur at, at 20 to 30 picoseconds. Um, and then they propose the, the dynamics, uh, or together we actually propose the dynamics. Um, the only exit is the is the ligand on the surface. So we thought that maybe the excitation of the high energy um, CH mode, so the um, stretch modes in ligands, um, uh, will will then transfer the energy to the mid to low energy organic modes because it's in the same molecule that transfers fast. Um, and then that, that um, transfer uh, the energy to the uh, low energy inorganic modes, and that's much longer. Um, so um, it, that, that is again tested uh, with um, abinational molecular dynamics. Um, so this is the phonon density of states um, calculated with the ligands. Um, and then the simulation set up like this, we have a slab of uh, methyl, uh, actually FA in this case, FA uh, let bromide, and we stick a ligand molecule on the surface um, uh, in two different uh, monodentate and didentate um, linkage. Um, and then we look at the uh, energy transfer uh, between the ligand um, let bromide and the FA molecule. Um, so um, the time scale is um, consistent with what experimentalists um, sort of uh, think uh, is happening. Um, an analogous simulation for um, cesium lab bromide shows that the results are, are different. Um, and um, the organic cations are uh, found, the organic cations are found to be responsible for this low um, equil equilibration. So I went through that quite quickly in the interest of time. Um, but, um, you know, the, the take home lesson is that we can use abinational molecular dynamics to understand some of these ultra fast observations. Um, instead of watching a, a temperature uh, um, uh, simulations or at a fixed temperature, we actually play around with exciting the molecules in different ways. We can excite um, <laughs> um, the molecules by the 
Um, and then what we find is there's a lot of interesting slow dynamics happening um, in the perovskites once we play with these uh, AIMD simulations. Um, so with that, I would like to just put the conclusion. Um, we we work very closely with ultrafast spectroscopy and density functional theory calculations. Um, we sort of had a first explanation for um, what's happening uh, if you excite the material with different photons. It's a complex interaction between electrons and phonons that actually cause a slow drain of energy um, and, and therefore observed a slow um, lifetime. And then um, we, we then play around with uh, stretching of um, NH modes, as well as a, the effect of surface ligands and how heat is transferred um, from outside the nanoparticle to inside the nanoparticle. So with that, I like to acknowledge um, all sorts of funding, uh, mostly with uh, the uh, Department of Energy. Um, and I like to take any additional questions. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Marie. Yep. So we'll take questions. There's actually a couple of questions. Well, three questions in the slide. Sorry, okay. in the chat. Yeah, so sorry. Question from John Bosco. Uh -huh. um, he's asking two questions. How does the computation calculation, how does the computation um, using descriptors meet accuracy when you compare with DFT calculations that are expensive? Like what's uh, what are your errors? I guess you can see from the scatter plots, right? Yeah, so this is an example. Um, we find that transition levels are typically predicted to about 0.2, maybe 0.3 EV, um, and formation energies are a bit higher errors, maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5 EV. Um, so this is actually pretty good because um, DFT themselves have errors. So we're training on DFT data, so all the DFT errors are already encoded in it. Uh, but of course, there's some some scatter here. But in addition, the machine learning error is usually about 0 0.2, 0 0.25 EV for impurity levels. Okay. Um, yeah, so so it's not bad because the the band gap for these materials the, is very high. Like this slide was too fast. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask a question. So, like this slide you are showing us, the yeah. horizontal axis is from CISO, right? No, so this is not CISO. Um, this is sort of how a. You, so how did you find this formula? Um, this this was a, a a smaller like it's it's CISO like um, which is from a smaller um, combination um, you know not not so extensive and we use lasso. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Then there's a question about the phonons. Why didn't you see on stable modes? Why did we see what? Why. Why do, don't you see unstable modes? If you're working with this um, pseudo-cubic structure, then shouldn't you see unstable modes from the phonon coupling? Yeah, we, we do, we do. We do have a, a few uh, imaginary modes that we ignored. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, depends on the material. Um, the the, the iodide in the pseudo-cubic definitely have a, a, a imaginary modes. Um, we just didn't a, a consider it. Um, with the understanding that you know if uh, we're doing uh, molecular dynamics, um, then you know distortions will be allowed um, and the effect will be small. Um, the other thing is that we didn't um, do any excitations of the inorganic modes themselves. I mean, we mostly did uh, excitation on the organic modes and then run AIMD. Um, so all the imaginary modes are on the inorganic subletters, so that didn't affect our initial excitation, and hopefully it didn't, you know, with the, a, a little bit of finger cross, uh, hopefully it didn't affect too much of the dynamics uh, in the AIMD. Okay. Yeah, that's a great uh, point. Other questions? I have questions, but I'll let other people ask. Hello? Yeah, thank you for the talk. I just want to know whether you would like to share the source of your data for machine learning with us. Thank you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Please um, feel free to send me an email. Um, your machine learning data. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm happy to share the data uh, from the machine learning um, to the, uh, from the paper, all the calculations 
um, the impurity levels we calculate, I'm ha happy to share it uh, with you. Um, just feel free to send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but also, um, yes, you talk about uh, organic phenom. Can you say there is a difference between uh, between polaron formed by organic polar or organic phenom and inorganic phenom? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Um, so we didn't actually, um, you know, do an explicit like uh, consideration of the polaron um, because we didn't have couple the electronic excitation um, to the phonons. Um, so you know we can't really say anything about polarons. Okay. Um, so Maria, let me ask you. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I would like you to help us talk more uh, about uh, how to determine the stability of these materials. Then also, uh, you displayed in one of the slides the machine learning uh, band gap and DFT band gap. So I would like to know if you consider the deficiency of DFT in determining the band gap of uh, materials and how do we correct the uh, deficiency? Will GW be appropriate? Yeah, no, that's a great point. So what happens with methanol ammonium lead uh, iodide in, in particular and a little bit bromide too is the uh, complex, the interplay of um, DFT band gap error and spin orbit coupling. So by um, if you calculate and gap, actually pretty close to the uh, because the errors are in opposite direction. So DFT under predict the band gap or PBE at least under predict the band gap, but uh, neglecting spin orbit coupling uh, over predict the band gap. So if you do GW, you have to add in uh, spin orbit coupling, which is which is fine. Um, you know, it's just that the calculations will then be prohibitive to do for a large number of elements. So we're using a, a accident, uh, these calculations that um, the band gap is actually, you know, pretty reasonable. Now that may fall apart when you replace lead with tin um, and, you know, iodide with bromide. And, and, you know, if you do all light elements, the spin orbit coupling effect will become smaller. Uh, and then you might not have the cancellation of error again. Um, so definitely there's a lot of, um, you know, a potential pitfall in these calculations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you please also talk more about the stability of the oscite? How to determine its stability? Yeah, so um, we we look at stability um, in different in different ways. So one of them is stability against decomposition to the um, binary halides. Um, so you have a you know a b x three right. So um, you 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 can look at the decomposition into a x and b x two for example. Um, and we calculate that, and we calculate the energy of the M uh, or ABX3 versus the composition into those two um, types of halides. Um, so that is one measure of stability. Um, that uh, that's thermodynamic decomposition. There's additional stability, and I, I didn't talk about in this talk, or we're working on um, is stability against uh, voltage, uh, water. Um, so we, we have some work on looking at um, how water changes uh, perovskite. Uh, also, how ion migration occur under voltage. So those are like different stability issues. Um, and other stability issues we haven't worked on, but it's uh, talked about is um, you know sort of photo stability, um, how how um, the light actually um, decomposes um, um, the material, um, especially the um, organic volatile material. And that that's sort of a little bit beyond the scope of what DFT calculations can do. Um, Maria, let me ask you a general question. Why do these materials work so well? <laughs> that is a million dollar question. I don't know anyone can answer that. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a, a theory and I'm not, you know, uh, going to claim that I am um, responsible for it, but that, you know, it, it works really well because um, of the defect properties, right? That all intrinsic defects uh, are shallow, um, and therefore, you know, the, the photophysics is extraordinary. Well, there's nothing causing recombination, 
Um, and we can see a little bit of that when you switch from iodide to bromide to chloride, it starts to go uh, far apart, like in terms of the defect dynamics. Um, a lot of the intrinsic defects become more deep um, if you go from iodide to chloride. And in literature, you also find that, um, you know, the chloride, the pure chloride doesn't work. The lifetimes are really small. Um, so, so that might be, you know, one reason, but yeah, there's a lot more, you know, it's ongoing discussion. Why does this work so well? And why does this um, fall apart so easily? Like, you know, the, the lifetime really is, um, uh, you know, the lifetime of the material is not very good. The lifetime of the carriers are great, you know, as you first synthesize it. Okay. Um, thank you, Maria. So, Maria, do you want to talk about the computational resources because somebody asked? Yeah, yeah. So, I put it in the chat um, to everyone. Um, email me at mchan at anl.gov uh, if you're interested in um, getting a, a, a computer time. So sh do you want to share the, um, the flyer you just sent? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I would like to do that. Or I, can, I, can, or I can share that too. I have it in my email. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Are you, sh are you sharing? No, no, you will share. Okay, I will share them. Let me open it. Okay. So, share screen. Okay. So, um, so this is a resource network for nanoscience applying for computer time. Um, so anyone who, who wants to use, um, you know, it says the electronic structure because that is, um, you know, the, the uh, collaboration, but even if you do um, MD or um, finite element, any kind of simulations where you use a computer, um, you, you are able to apply. So the only key thing that um, one needs to consider is that um, we have to justify it in terms of nanoscience. So the problem has to be related somehow to uh, nano, nanoscience or nanotechnology. So if you're studying perovskites and the um, you know, interactions that certainly qualify, you're looking at the um, nanoscopic um, you know, properties of it using DFT, that's only qualified, but you know, in terms of other problems, we might have to take a look. Um, so um, there's this form here. Um, I can click on that. Oh, yeah, I, I don't have it. I don't have a sign in to Google, but um, there's a form here that you can you can look at, and it's very simple form. Um, how um, you know what's the problem? Everything is should be like just one paragraph or a few sentences. Um, uh, on the first two, uh, you know, one paragraph is enough. Um, in terms of how you use high performance computational resources, uh, you might want to do a little more detail, like what code you use, um, what you will calculate, um, what you want to get out of it. Um, and I discussed earlier that um, um, if we can move this deadline to like October 25th, um, that will allow us to submit the, the um, uh, proposal for, for this round. Um, but even any time we're able to uh, allocate something like um, 100,000 core hours um, to, to you know, start you on the project. Um, so that that's certainly okay, um, and and of course this organizing this this um, whole thing was coordinated by U.S. Africa Initiative in Electronic Structure, uh, the Omo, Shane, and others. Um, um, uh, Richard Martin uh, have been working very hard on. Um, so you know we're, we're grateful for for you guys to bring bring us all together. Okay. Yeah. So to add to what um, Mara is saying, so we have an initiative um, called US African Initiative. And um, as part of the initiative, the some national labs in the US are allowing us to have computer time on their clusters. So, but you have to apply for this computer time. And so we'll send out a poster to everybody. Um, that's the poster that um, Maria shared just now. Um, I can share it again. 
So we are we'll be sending out the poster to everybody. And uh, we'll have it on our IFA website also. So you can apply for computer resources to do work in nanoscience. Um, so the advice is that once you write something, you fill the form. If you need help, you can contact Maria. And if you say you want to collaborate with her or with someone else, you can do that also. So we can write something to collaborate. Yeah. Ali yeah. also and collaboratively with us, Maria, and with quite a number of people, other people. So um, the first deadline, like she said, is 25th of October. But then after that, you can send it in and we can look at it on a rolling basis. So this uh, will change this to 25th of um, October. And then after that, we'll just take it on a rolling basis. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can um, direct them to us. Um, so we still use this assessment net um, at ifi.org. More information about USA Africa, you can get it on the website also. So we'll distribute this um, announcement and you'll be able to apply for the computational resources. So let's thank Maria again. For thank you so much. I, I don't know if I can still ask a question before okay, Maria leaves. Ask your question. Maria, please. I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. With, with respect to the stability of perovskites, uh, will calculations and check if there will be uh, imaginary frequency and then uh, conclude that uh, the material is unstable because of the presence of imaginary frequency. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, that is sort of the not the kind of instability that is relevant. Uh, so, any imaginary frequency you calculate is really a, really a defect of the front state DFT uh, and can be corrected. So, we have a, a non interrupt case where we've done some work on uh, renormalization that will um, allow you to find the distortion essentially or sample the you know correct temperature um, composition that will remove the imaginary frequencies. Uh, but that's not the instability that causes the to break, you know, in sometimes a month, sometimes a few days, depends on how you uh, encapsulate it. it the, the, the stability there has to do with decomposition, uh, moisture effect, uh, ion migration, sort of much larger, uh, more drastic changes to the material. Um, the phonon instability really it's just a minute motion of the octahedron, like a small rotation of the octahedron, and 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 you can definitely you know correct for that uh, with uh, finite temperature sampling. Does that answer your question? Oh, I think we might have lost him. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much again, Maria. Yeah. Thanks. All right, very nice meeting all of you. Great day. Thank you so much. I think I lost my next one.